Hi everyone, you're very welcome here to our channel, NarcCon, where we deal with all things in relation to the narcissistic personality disorder. And that doesn't mean, you know, calling someone a narcissist just as a kind of slang term. This means a real narcissist that we're talking about. The real behaviour, disordered behaviour patterns of someone who is truly a narcissist and generally a covert narcissist. Um, that we cover here because they're trickier. They can get into somebody's life. They can enmesh someone in with them, giving a false identity of their persona, wearing a very fake mask and really being fraudsters, really being con artists, as the channel is called. So we're going to deal with something that's come up in coaching recently. And if it comes up multiple times, I usually cover it in a podcast. So that's the origin of the idea for this podcast in relation to the female narcissists. Very, very poisonous discard an ensuing smear campaign, an ensuing trap that they set up for their victims. All narcissists operate from the centre of their narcissistic core. So male and females motivations for their behaviours and their behaviour patterns come from the same dark narcissistic core. However, there are some slight variations to the behaviours that these, the different sexes use against the, usually the opposite sex is most effective. Please forgive me for any generalization and nothing here is meant to be sexist. It's just to get across to you a method a female narcissist will use that is most effective if they have a male intimate partner. Male narcissists will use a slight different variation of this topic, but I'd like to get into the succinctness of the female narcissistic discard and smear campaign and entrapment post relationship that they use on their male partners. Because guys, I want you warned and I would like if anyone has a family member that's going through this, that maybe you can pass on this information to them. It may well save a huge amount of distress, huge amount of trauma. It may save money. It may save somebody's life. Okay. Female narcissists, like male narcissists, get into intimate relationships, looking for their needs to be met. And those needs are generally status, finances, um, how easy the person is to control and how much emotional output can be manipulated um, with that person that they have in mind. Basically, how easy this person is going to be to con, to defraud, to get things from. That's what they're looking at. They're hunters. They're not capable of love. They set their sights on someone and they go for getting that person, that unfortunate target or victim of the narcissist. They will usually try to entrap them by the traditions of marriage and quickly having children or children prior to marriage, whichever way they're going to operate. Those are the two main entrapment styles of most narcissists, but particularly the female narcissist. They will stay in a marriage and have children for even lengthy enough times. They can even stay in marriages for five to ten years as long as they're getting their needs met. They often, with marriage partners, will take a step up socially so that they're going to improve their position in life. They generally will look for some kind of advancement or enhancement. So 
what you're often getting is someone from a a very streetwise background maybe or uh taking advantage of maybe a more academic family they're i'm trying to put this in the right way in a nice way they're basically looking for a step up in society that's going to reflect well on them they may even leave their background behind them and become wholly part and parcel of this new family that they've entered into when they actually enter into that situation they will often and always in my opinion isolate their partner from their family structure particularly if that family structure is very strong and supportive of the partner now there are different scenarios and different circumstances as to how this plays out you may be living with the female narcissist in the city so it's easier for them to isolate their partner from family for instance or you may be in a small countryside situation where the family is all around the narcissist partner anyway so they will do a, what i call a present isolation in that they will be critiquing the family while pretending to be part of it so they're always complaining to the partner about the family yet participating in it and enjoying the status that the family provides and also using the partner's family if they're lumped in with them in a small small community they will use the partner's family for narcissistic supply and to create drama while they're in the relationship i know you've come on here to learn about the narcissist discard this is all pertinent enough in relation to what comes next. Isolation, particularly with the female narcissist, is one of their key tactics to have control of their man or their woman. But in particular, we're dealing with the man, male, female dynamic in this. And I'll get into why that's very important. This is a particular soup song, a particular su succinct tweak and vile manipulation that the female narcissists use in particular against a male partner. So the female, let's just take a situation where they're going to discard the partner, even if they've had children with them, even if they've married them, even if they've not been married to them. And in my experience, it always comes down to the same reasons the narcissist discards, both male and female narcissists discard. The two main reasons, and there are a lot of reasons, but the two main reasons are the partner has started to put in some boundaries. The partner is exhausted or the partner keeps putting in boundaries. So the female narcissist is not able to become queen bee of the male, basically. The male is resisting. There's resistance there, which is a threat to the female narcissist control. The female narcissist will do a huge amount of maneuvering to get that control, particularly if they have targeted a supreme supply source. In other words, they may have targeted somebody that has money, that has land, that has status, that has great career prospects that's you know famous or that's going to provide them with a big step up in life or invest in their company or for whatever reason this is a prime target they will really maneuver their way around to getting full control of that target if they cannot get full control of that target that is definitely a trigger to discard and to look around for what they consider a better return for their money target so they may choose someone that you'd be looking at and saying how could they pick that person over the person that they were with maybe in terms of you know financial resources looks or whatever that the other person seemed you know and it's quite confusing for people who decide you're a you know a gold digger or a money grabber or whatever 
yet you've gone for someone, you know, that doesn't have as much. And it confuses people and throws them off the scent, thinking maybe I was wrong about that, that, that person being a narcissist. You know, maybe they, what they were saying which was genuine, you know, when they criticized their partner. Maybe they're not a narcissist. That's a tricky one, but it's, it, it's, it's one that trips people up. But don't get tricked by it. If the prime target that the female narcissist has gone for or even married and had children with is beginning to put in boundaries or that female narcissist has come to a point where the supply output from their male partner has dwindled or has gotten to a plateaued level where they feel they're, they need more, they need more and narcissists always need more, then they're going to look elsewhere. And they may well settle because we tend to give the narcissist too much credit for their ability to go out and find somebody as good as us or better than us. So in whatever terms you like to put that. So they may go to a transitionary supply, someone that they're going to actually use as they always do, but not settle with but use against their former fantastic supply. It's yet another maneuver. Everything with the narcissist is a maneuver. So I'm going to get into the female aspect of this particular maneuver in the female narcissist discard. Then I'm also going to get into what that feels like in some ways for the person that's discarded. And I'm also going to give some pointers as to how you can handle their attempt at your enmeshment post discard. Because believe it or not, no matter what they have said and what you think, they still have you in their sights as a back pocket supply or actually still their main target. And that is something that people go, no, Paula, no, you're wrong there, you're wrong. Uh, no, yes. Still as their main target. This is another style of manoeuvre to get you back under control and pumping out supply or else just to have you there as a comfort blanket as they transition through life and through other supply sources. So without labouring that point, The female narcissist will give you a horrendous discard, will usually tell you, and this is leading into why they use their new supply against you here. They'll usually tell the man, and again, this can apply if there's two female partners, but this is the tactic most effective with men. They'll usually tell the man that they're not up to scratch, that as a man, they fall short, that they haven't provided enough for the female, for the female narcissist, that, you know, the man has been really lucky to have this woman because this woman is sought after by so many men. And, you know, that the man is faulty in relation to relationship material. This and that the man is not a good protector or provider. And I know you'll know where I'm coming from now. Men and women are essentially different from a primal perspective. Our primal drivers in a gender sense, even though they've changed and they can be the total opposite in a man and a woman, I'm generalizing here just generalizing that the, the majority of the primal instincts of a male would be to protect and provide and be competitive for a woman, you know, feel that they're able to keep their woman, that they're able to do all these things, that they're appreciated for who they are, but also for the male side of themselves. And that they would compete with other males as you would. I often bring 
the whole survival and narcissistic dynamic back to jungles and animals and warfare, because that's important. So it's important with the basic understanding of human behaviour. So the male is set up to be proud of the woman that they've, you know, engaged with and that they're their mate and to want to provide and protect their mate and to have felt that they have achieved, you know, that, that they have the best that they can get and that they've competed with other males you know, just like elephants do. Sorry, guys, I'm not I'm not comparing you totally to elephants. This is the primal driver instincts of the male, you know, where they'll fight for the herd or they'll fight for the female. So that is in us. That primal instinct is in, in us. And a narcissist will help you touch that primal instinct where you're not thinking, you're going on a gut kind of reaction, on an emotional reaction to the very basic essence of your gender or your maleness or your femaleness. And that's why I'm doing this particular podcast, because I really, really would like you to understand and not react to this particular maneuver that female narcissists use against their male partners. They may also use it against a female partner who has that um, more male tendency, more male driver instinct. So what they do, there's two different scenarios. Um, and again, these are examples that have come up in coaching. Just anonymously, I will use them. And I hope they're helpful to you guys. If you're listening to this, you know who you are. So there's the setting where you might have the city female narcissist, the city female narcissist and the country female narcissist. Their main modus operandi is to keep tabs on their primary um, post ex target who they still want in their lives for, again, what we, we've explained, one of two reasons. One is they want to get them back and get them further under control to capitulate to them. And two is to have them there as a, a financial supply, childcare supply, um, maybe even house supply, maybe to get back with them at some stage. It's basically to keep them hooked and enmeshed and away from getting um, away from these these male partners um, to stop them from going with other females, particularly when there's children involved. So the city example would be the female narcissist and the country example. They will get a partner, another partner, and they will literally use this partner as a rag doll to hold up to their previous male partner and say look I'm so popular every man wants me this man adores me he'll do everything for me that you couldn't do for me or wouldn't do for me I adore him he adores me look look He's so much better than you. Imagine all the things we're doing together. He does it much better than you. And you know what we're talking about. And that will be constant. That will be constant. You will get to hear about it from flying monkeys. You will get them passing by where you normally go for your coffee. They'll be sat there in the corner looking loving lovingly into each other's eyes they will set you up with this to go into your primal male brain your your ancient brain to say my woman with him no good i fail <laughs> i hope this doesn't come across wrong guys i i know that you know what i'm saying this is the the very essence of the maleness in you erupts it just it's just instinctual and you can lose it you can lose it and that's exactly what she wants you to do it is exactly what she wants you to do so i'm going to park that as to the reasons why and just go into the fallout of the discard this is the main point that I'm making in relation to 
the rag, let's call it the rag doll, other supply that the narcissist has hooked up to punish you with, to taunt you with, to get you under control with, this person means nothing to them. This person means nothing to them. Awful as it is to say, usually they'll pick someone who is so easy to control and that poor person is going to be destroyed because the narcissist is giving them full attention, full affection, bringing them under control, totally conning them, totally defrauding them as to who the, pers the narcissist actually is. The darkness, the vileness, the evilness that's in that particular female narcissist is well hidden with sweetness and pinkness and kisses and hugs and whatever load of BS that they're coming out with to cover up the fact that they're a nasty piece of work. If the female narcissist in keeping tabs on you can get to you via flying monkeys to keep the information pouring in in relation to your loss and their gain, they will. If they can infiltrate your workplace, they will. They need to stay within the grasp of you. And I'm talking about the city situation in this case. They will do their best to make you jealous. They will do their best to bring out the competitiveness in you. They will do their best to have a re-engaging conversation with you as to let's talk. Let's let's discuss, you know, what went wrong with us and maybe we can try again. They'll get you to the point where you want to do that. Then they'll get in. Then they'll say they're pregnant. Then they will look for marriage to seal the deal if they're to come back and be really nice and love bomb you for two or three months. They'll have left enough time for you to miss them. They will have discarded you and discombobulated your mind and told you it's your fault. And then they'll show you the rag doll. Much better than you. Look, look, look. Much better than you. Gives me everything I want does everything for me. You're crap. He's great. Male brain, act in. Try and get me back. Compete for me. Compete for me. Everyone wants me. Everyone wants me. I'm valuable. Guys, don't fall for it. You get entrapped with this witch and you are in trouble. They will decimate your life, particularly if they had to try that hard to get you back under control. They will resent you for it. They will hate you for it if they don't already hate you for not allowing your boundaries to fall down enough for them to get in. Now, going back to the country situation or small community situation where everyone knows everyone and the narcissist is unfortunately still in your environment. That narcissist, female narcissist, will have totally resented your family over the years and having to pretend to like your family, to your family's face and to the community's face, etc. And have to pretend to be the good wife, the good mother, the good whatever. They will cause as much drama as is possible to cause. They will use the system, use the law, use female aid, refuges, etc., where they're actually the perpetrator of the violence. They will con the lot and as much as they can. And they have an advantage. They still have a traditional advantages in some places where it is not acknowledged that a lot of females actually are capable of physical violence, coercive control, psychological abuse, emotional abuse, and spiritual bombardedness, spiritual annihilation. So they're already a step up in relation to societal um, kind of generally held beliefs that if a woman says she's been hit and she's been this and she's been that, that the woman, again, a generalization, I think traditionally the woman is tends to be more believed no matter how gentle her husband or partner is 
or has been, no matter how abused they have been, no matter how much standing they have in the community. And this is a battle. This is a battle you have got to go through. And I'm going to give you pointers as to how to tackle this in the best possible way, because you can get through it. But you need to know who you're fighting and what kind of a battle you're fighting to adopt a strategy that's going to be the most beneficial to you. It's not going to give you a walkover, not initially, but eventually it will. So the effect and the fallout in a smaller community gathering is not just on the narcissist target that they've left, not just on their male partner, but it extends out into the family because the family will be targeted also. The family, by default, will be punished for being associated with their former partner. And it is a devastating, destructive experience. The family needs to come together. The family needs to come together and the family needs to try and defocus on what this narcissist is going to do next. Because once one drama is over, once the narcissist has put something out into the community about their ex-partner and his family, when it all dies down, the narcissist needs to stir the pot again. The narcissist is not satisfied with becoming um, last yesterday's news. The narcissist, in order to feel relevant and powerful, and remember, the narcissist is with someone they don't want to be with at the moment, despite the fact that it looks like they found God's gift to woman and man. That is not the case. So it is very traumatic and destructive for the family. The family needs to defocus in as much as possible once they realise what they're dealing with and get back to as much normalcy as possible. Go on a holiday if you can. I know we can't go on holidays all of our lives, but take some time out of the boxing ring. Reaffirm your family. Have a celebration. Keep doing what you normally do as a family so that you're not cowering away, looking like you're guilty. This is what the narcissist hopes you will do. They hope you will cower down, wait for it all to be over and, you know, emerge again. This is exactly what the narcissist wants you to do. And the more you emerge out, the more stories initially will come up, will become about you. But you have to go through that pain barrier. Ignore it. If someone comes up to you and talks to you about the narcissist, you say, I'm sorry to hear that. And then change the subject and ask the person, how are they doing and how are things? So that it is not a feature of the conversation. You know, you're not not talking about it. You're not ignoring it or walking away from the person who brings it up. You're just saying, I'm sorry to hear she's unwell or whatever. And you then talk to the person about themselves or about other things. These are strategies. They don't seem very, you know, very strong strategies. But the combination of the strategies that I'm going to go into now are the strongest strategies you can use against this vile, evil destructiveness that's going on in the smear campaign a narcissist will use against her target and a target's family. So what the target needs to do, what the, the male who's left needs to understand is in order for the narcissist to be the victim, to present as the victim, to get all the sympathy because victims get sympathy, victims get help, victims get a sense of control, narcissistic victims. When people are criticizing or in agreeing with them to criticize their ex-partner, that gives them a great sense of vile satisfaction. It makes them feel empowered. What you do not need to do is to play into the picture that the narcissist has painted of you in the community. The narcissist wants you, wants to have evidence of texts and calls, of you knocking at their door, you know, of you appearing to be the evil, aggressive stalker that they have painted you out to be. 
They will set you up in so many different ways to frustrate you. If you're looking for something urgently from them, they won't be available or they'll tell you where they are when they're with the new supply and you come looking. They won't answer the door. You will knock again. You will shout in the window. You will ring their phone and text. What you need is urgent. There they are with the new supply. I'm so in demand. My ex won't leave me alone. I'm so beautiful. I'm so gorgeous. Men just love me. But what am I going to do? Can you protect me against this evil monster? He wants me all the time and he follows me everywhere and he won't leave me alone because I'm so gorgeous. Need I say more? Okay, you don't want to play into the role they've written for you in the smear campaign and discard. Guys, when they're holding up the new supply, let's call it the rag doll manipulation. Look at him, he's better than you, he's better in the you know what department. Much better in fact. In fact, he's so much better that he is Adonis and you're a little mouse. They will do anything they can to get that primal, ancient gut reaction from you. And you may flip. Don't flip. Don't respond to the texts. Don't do it. Don't go around looking, feeling bad about yourself. This is simply a manipulation the female narcissist uses time and time again. There is nothing personal in it, even though you're taking it as personal. This is what they do to all men, to all men they discard. This is nothing about you and how great you were or how not great you were or how great in bed you were or how not great in bed you were. Nothing to do with that. It is a button they're using to push you because they know that is the most difficult to resist button. That's your inner male button that they're pressing. I hope I'm getting this across strong enough. They all do this. I mean, male narcissists use triangulation as well, but mostly, you know, if they're going to, if the male narcissist holds up another woman and says, well, they're much better in bed, you're kind of go, well, Grant, I'm not interested in being Mrs. M Mrs. Adonis. You know, it doesn't affect me that much. Like, you know, I I feel fine about my performances, etc. It's not that male kind of button. Unless you're whatever, you know, as a generalization, it's not going to affect us women as much. We might be, you know, jealous about it. how does she look? Does she, why, you know, what's so much better about her? But we're not that inclined in relation to, I don't think anyway, leave in the comments if you were particularly triggered by your male narcissists pushing the female the female partner in your face. Again, I think you get the distinction. It, it's just, this is the prime button for the male that the female narcissist can press. Okay, we're gonna get into how to deal with this trigger. First thing to do is understand that it has nothing to do with you as a person. But the narcissist wants you to believe that it has everything to do with you as a person. Manipulation, falsehood, mark that down, understand it. The next thing to do, and the, the female narcissist, sorry, I, I did leave this out and I shouldn't have. The female narcissist will definitely use those children against you, as you know, to keep you under control, to keep you entrapped, to keep you triggered. Um, to keep you going to court, to keep you all those things, to torment you, just as the male narcissists do as well with the children. Um, so in relation to this whole thing, the first thing is to understand what you're dealing with and who you're dealing with. The second thing is to document, this is particularly with children, but also if you feel you're being used, you know, this coercive control being used or they're turning up at your workplace or they're harassing you with emails or their or texts or whatever. If there's something on towards that you feel isn't right, get a notebook, note it down or put it in your notes on your phone, whatever. Document times, places and what happened. Even if you don't ever use them, 
it's good to have these instances if you do have to use them at some stage. And you, with a narcissist, you never ever know when you might have to use something. The third thing, of course, is not to react. Not to react when you're triggered in this way. The, the fourth thing is to block the texts. You don't need to be getting texts from this narcissist continually. You don't need it. Ch even children or no children, even a business that you have together, even if you're going through a divorce, I strongly recommend you take control of your life and block that narcissist on the texts or whatever. So that the only way they can contact you, still leaving an area, an, an avenue of contact open, leave your email open to them. And then at a certain time each day, you read that email when you're in a good place, when you're in the best place possible that you can be mentally and in every other way. You read, look at your email, if you have to. If you don't have to, if you can go no contact altogether, that's the best. Because then your brain isn't being re-triggered all the time. The neural pathways, the, the water is not flowing through them. The electricity is not flowing through them. You're getting rid of the cognitive dissonance. You're going getting back to normal. This is really, really important because the narcissist will push and push and push. Their constancy is going to wear the best of us down, the strongest of us down. It's going to lead to post-traumatic stress syndrome. You find yourself shaking. You find yourself disassociating like you're in a room and you're hearing voices a couple of many seconds later than the voices were actually being spoken. You feel like you're kind of watching a movie as you're looking at the room. You can't make decisions, you know, even simple decisions you question yourself over. You find yourself being vague and just sitting there for times where you kind of realize, oh, I've been sitting here for a while and you get up to do something. You can't concentrate on things. There are so many symptoms of post-traumatic stress and it won't go away unless you do something to help yourself. And one of them is to block the narcissist and only have one avenue of contact open to them. This will initially frustrate the hell out of them and you may get them calling around. So you may think, oh, I can't block them again because I can't go through that again. This is the war. You're at war at the moment. So you have to fight with the best weapon that you have and no contact is a best weapon or an email only open. And if they come knocking on your door, if they start to give you hassle, if they start to hang themselves with their own rope, you document it. You document it so that at some stage you have enough evidence of them not turning up in time for the kids, of them stalking you, harassing you, causing problems for you in work, that you have enough evidence to go to court again. This is an important one, um, actually. This is an important one. And I just, I did mention it a while back. You don't hide at home. And this is a hard one because people are often so stressed and in such a terrible state with what's going on that they don't feel they can face people. But if you're surrounded with a, a family, a strong family connection, go out and be seen. Because if you're seen and you're acting normal and you're, you know, laughing with friends or you're doing your work and you're just getting on with things, the monster image that the narcissist has presented doesn't quite gel with what the general community are seeing, you being a hardworking person or with your kids and getting on with things. They're kind of scratching their head going, you know, I always liked him and like, I've never seen him being like that with anyone else. And he's a hardworking lad, like, um, so you get the drift. It, it decreases the veracity of the monster that you've been painted to be. Whereas if you're out of the picture, you know, missing in action, they're building and building and building into the picture of you being a monster and you're hiding away, so to speak, to the general population. They're thinking, gosh, I didn't know that he was like that or she was like that or whatever. And you're not there. So 
They're building a new image of you in their minds. So be present. Get your family to do what they normally do as much as possible. It's very effective, very frustrating for a narcissist. I'll tell you that for nothing. And they can often out themselves by escalating what they're trying to do, which initially may drive the family and you back home or stop you from going out with your friends or whatever. But actually, it's giving the narcissist enough rope to hang themselves so that people will see, you know, they're really, that the people will kind of go, they keep going on and on and on about this person being so bad. Maybe there's something wrong with them themselves, the narcissist themselves. So it plays out as you use and adopt these strategies in general. The next one is to work on yourself. You've been through a battle. You've been through a war. You're back home in civilian life again. That's literally what it is akin to after you've been through an enmeshment with a narcissist where they continually try and keep you enmeshed in their vile world. So you need to get back to civilian life again. Put your civvies on and work on rebuilding your life and yourself and your interests and who you are. And the very last thing I would say, I think, because this is this is what I really, really want to get across for you guys. And if you have a relation who's going through this to be able to help them, it's a terrible time. It's a terrible time for a guy or a girl. Um, is to have a future plan. Start to think about your life without the narcissist. And sometimes people go, I don't think this is ever going to end. I can't see it ending. And they give up and, and the worst can happen. I promise you, there's only so long a narcissist will keep that level of vileness and destruction up. And the more you implement these strategies, the less effective the narcissist's manipulations are, the harder you're, you're providing a, a boundaries and you're being harder to control. That's not of interest to the narcissist. So if you're not falling into their plan and playing the roles that they're providing for you and entrapping you into, it becomes too damn difficult. And they do start sniffing around for another big primary target to go for. It's not to say they won't be back sporadically, particularly if you have children with them and have to deal with them. You need to get to court again. You need to fight. You need to document the times they've left the children with you um, at the last minute. You need to, to get set up in this particular circumstance. You need to get away from the narcissist. You need uh, not have anyone the narcissist knows in your environment or in your workplace. You need to go to court and get the courts to put a plan of action that the narcissist needs to stick to. So the narcissist can't keep manipulating you with being late and cancellations because you're going to document them and say, this is too difficult. These are the problems that the narcissist is presenting to me and it's affecting the children. That's what you have to go to court with, how it affects your children. And if you have to go to court again, you go to court again, even after the second time. The narcissist will get eventually fed up. And they will go on to probably leave the kids with you more because they'll be out hunting for somebody new. But they'll eventually get fed up with that battle. They don't have a great concentration span. They don't like to be challenged continually because that affects their mask that threatens their sense of of this false persona that they've put up that they need to believe in just as much as other people need to believe in that's the shield between the true self them and the world so guys that's about it on the female narcissist discard being slightly different to the male discard in that they use your primal instincts, gender instincts against you. Again, as a generalization, again, it's only my opinion from experience, education, perception, intuition, coaching. 
that's what I found for what it's worth. If the information is of value, can you please give a thumbs up, um, a like and a share would be great because that gets the word out. From Remy and from myself, we will say bid you adieu and I hope that information has been helpful and we will see you again shortly. Take very good care of yourselves in the meantime.